Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I am Ponchasu. Introducing Endless Space 2. I'm extraordinarily excited to bring this video to you. And in case you are not aware of how my videos work, this one is going to be similar to my Introducing Endless Legend video, which contained a basic tutorial. In fact, in this particular video, I plan to make it mostly a basic tutorial for people who have, for example, little knowledge about this kind of games in general, or maybe just played Endless Space 1 a little, or and don't know what to expect from Endless Space 2, or whatever, maybe you just want to make sure you are not missing any obvious things about this game, well, I'm here to help you. Now, that doesn't mean I won't give you any of my opinions about Endless Space 2. In fact, I will, but not too much or too many of those. Also, in no way should any of my opinions be treated as a review of any kind. Why? Because... I am closely affiliated with Amplitude Studios. I've been helping it out in many occasions. I've been testing this particular game way before any journalists got their hands on it. And I was even helping Amplitude out at Gamescom. So yes, I am biased, keep that in mind. However, that should not be important, for I will mostly try to explain this game for you. What is Endless Space 2? It is a 4x10 based strategy game set in, well, space. It's a science fiction game. What does 4x stand for? It stands for Explore, Expand, Exploit and Exterminate. So, in general, you start with a small empire, you make it into a big empire, you consume other empires if you are an evil person like me, and eventually you hopefully win the game or lose after trying. Now, let's go ahead and tell you what you need to do if you, for example, are a complete rookie and know nothing about the game. In that case, I would recommend you to start with an introduction. If you already own the game, that is, otherwise you should continue watching this video cast. This game does have a pretty in-depth tutorial that should explain most of the gameplay basics for you. Once you start your game, you can customize it to a decent extent. And also, before I forget, because I almost did, what you're seeing is a video footage of, as you can see down here, Alpha game version of this game. And I'm recording it before it is even going, before it even is on Steam on Early Access. In a few days, this game will come out on Steam Early Access, and then it will take probably a few months before this game is completely finished. Meaning that at the time of recording this video, and at the time of publishing this video most likely, uh, this game is missing a lot of features. For example, if you look at the factions available, right now there are only four factions available, and while they are very fleshed out, there are still some factions missing that will be added later, so you have to keep that in mind. The game doesn't have all of its late game technologies yet, so you also will not be able to test out any of the late game even if you purchase this game when it comes out on early access. Additionally, everything that you see in here is subject to change. Everything, literally everything can still change, so please do keep that in mind. Now, let us continue with the tutorializing. Act. So first of all, what you can do is well select out of the four empires that you have access to, which is a pretty, a pretty important thing. Let's go ahead and select the Cravers for the time being, which are a faction that is making a return from Endless Place 1. You can change the color. Finally, we have more colors than in the last Amplitude Studios games. I'm of course picking my favorite. You have several galaxy shapes to choose from. Only free for the time being, again, you have access to more once this game comes out, or once it has received some updates. You can customize the age of the galaxy and all other things you see, I don't think I need to read it out for you, you probably can read most likely. Now my personal preference is to set the resource abundance to low, to make people more competitive to try to get their strategic resources. Strategic resources are things that you need to construct various specialized things. They are not necessary for you to win the game, but they help you do that. And it's basically like oil in real life. Not everybody has it, but having it is nice and helps you a ton. So yeah, you can change your difficulty. If you are just starting this game, you probably should try it on a lower difficulty. But since, again, this is early access, still early in development, even on a less difficulty, this game is really not that difficult. By the way, I'm the kind of player who is known to never play below endless, and I always try to make the game as difficult and challenging for me as possible. So you definitely do have. So I, when you're looking for somebody who wants a challenge, 
that's me. I like a challenge. Let's change faction, enemy factions. It doesn't really matter for this video. You won't see too much of the gameplay. But yeah, let's go ahead and start the game. And as it's loading, I'm going to, well, I don't think I'm actually going to pause recording because it does launch pretty fast. So let's just wait for the loading screen to finish. Now there is an introduction video. We don't need to watch it right now. You can watch it when you play the game yourself or find it on YouTube because there are videos of that on YouTube already. So this is what you see when you start a game. If you're confused what you need to do, then I encourage you to, first of all, learn what your victory conditions are. You have saw them just before I started the game, and as the game advances through the development, it will have more victory conditions. Right now, these are the only two available to us. There is a score victory, which means that after a set number of turns, the player of the highest score, which is arbitrarily determined, will win the game. It's the kind of victory condition I personally dislike, and I always turn it off. However, uh, well, in the future, you will be you will have the freedom to choose what victory conditions you want or, or do not want to go for. The second victory conditions you can achieve is going to be the military victory, which means that you have to conquer other empires to win the game. As for all other victory conditions, they are disabled at the time of the recording of this video cast and will be enabled as the game advances through early access and is further in its development. Right now, it's early, so they are disabled. Still, looking at those victory conditions will tell you what you need to do to win the game. So let's say that you want to conquer the enemy by force. Well, you need to expand your empire to do that. How do you do that? Well, in order to conquer the enemy empire, you need to grow your own. And for that, you need to have more resources and expand. As, as I said, this is a forex game after all. So, how do you know where to expand or what to do? Well, you simply have to move your ships. You start with several ships, and the kind of ships you start with depends on the kind of faction you chose. So, for example, in here I've got a scavenger. This is my scouting ship. It's uh, pretty good at scouting things. So, in order to move my fleet, I'll just left-click on whatever fleet I want to move. I can select multiple of them. I can choose do it by holding shift to see if I just want to select a few of them. Doesn't matter. For now, I'll just select my scout and then I'll right click on any given lane or I can right click on a system I already explored. Right now, I'm just gonna right click over here, make my ship go in this direction. And there he goes. And in this case, he ran out of movement before he was able to discover anything. It is a 10 based game after all. If I want him to keep moving, I'll need to end my 10. But let's not do that just yet. Now, you do have a system that you start with. If I zoom in, I will be able to see what the system can do. But what does it mean? What do all of these numbers mean that you are looking at? Well, let's explain that to you real quick while zooming out. The things in the top left corner are your resources. In fact, let's zoom back in because you can see all of them in here. This game has resources that are commonly called or referred to as FITSI. It stands for food which is used to grow your population. The people who work for your empire, the workforce of your empire. Industry, it is what you use to actually make things, such as ships or improvements. Dust, which is basically your currency. It is used for various things, such as increasing the production of your planet, allowing you to complete certain production instantly, or maybe hiring heroes or repairing your ships or doing all kinds of other things. Science, which is used to create, unlock new technologies that allow you to further advance and improve your empire. And finally, influence, which is used for various kind of other things, such as, for example, interacting with other empires. Diplomacy requires you to use influence or conducting certain empire-wide actions also requires influence. It is used for various, uh, various things. If you have played Endless Legend, then all of those things should be fairly familiar to you because they, were, they work in pretty much the exact same way as they did in Endless Legend. So that's it. You also have some other resources, such as strategic resources, which are a bit different. They are not necessary for you to win the game, as I mentioned earlier. They just allow you to make some things that are very specialized and that can generally be considered more powerful, but you have very limited access to those strategic resources, so you have to manage them very carefully. Now, what you can do with your star system is actually fairly simple. You can make 
like I said, mix structures. And those structures will get, increase your system's resource output, allowing you to make more things in the future. It basically creates a snowball effect. So you want to keep making more things so you can make even more things, so you can make even more things, and the cycle never ends until you win or you lose. Let's leave the screen view for a second and have a quick look at all the other things. So what else do you need to do to win the game? You need to colonize. Now, depending on your faction, you may or you may not start with a colony ship. It's usually marked by a flag. You want to fly your colony ship to a different system and you want to colonize another planet. Let's zoom in on that system real quick. We see the system for a first time, so we'll be shown a little bit of, how do I call it? Cinematic-like video that will tell us a little bit about every planet. So if you don't know what each planet represents in terms of footsie, what each planet is good for, you can see that on this intro. It tells me that this planet is, for example, good for food. Or this planet is good for, it's decent for food and industry. And it does have some dust and science on it, but it's not very great for it. But this planet, for example, oh, it's great for dust. So if I'm looking for dust, I should probably colonize it, assuming I am capable of colonizing it at all. If you want to skip what you just saw, you just have to press the right mouse button. Or if you want to move ahead to the next planet, you press the left mouse button. Now, I cannot colonize any of those planets. They are uninhabitable to my population right now. I don't have the technology to colonize any of them. So I will need to keep going and keep exploring for other planets that I could colonize to make my empire bigger, wider and more powerful. Now, another thing you may notice is that those plants, they have so-called curiosities. Curiosities, well, you don't know what they are. You just know that there is something strange about those planets that I see over there. But what it is exactly, you do not know. You ha what you have to do is you have to send your scout ship, which has so-called probes on it. Probes can be used for two things. Either you can launch your probes into space, which I'll show you in a second. In fact, let's end the 10. Yes, I know that the technology is researched. I'll just want to showcase what I was talking about. So let's go ahead and end my turn. Now I've reached a system and my scout ship has two options. I can either launch probes, which will allow me to see what is going to be in this vague direction of the space. In three turns, this probe will run out, so it's only probably going to reach to around here. You can increase the probe's vision or how far it goes in with technologies. It's a very useful feature because there are certain things that are not connected to your home planet by uh, those lines. And those systems you can only find by the use of probes, so they are essential for you and you do have to use them in order to discover the entire galaxy, otherwise you will never be able to reach every place in your galaxy. It's very important. Another thing you can use your probes for is if we zoom on this system and again skip the intro. You can send your probes to analyze a curiosity. For example, in here I've got a subterranean curiosity. I've got a free probe to use. Let's go ahead and use it and discover what this plant has to offer. In this case, it has a certain luxury resource, which is different from strategic resource. It, luxuries are used to improve your entire empire at once. So okay, I that's good to know. This plant has two uh, this plant has two features on it that are both positive. So to large resources, so it's probably good to colonize it if I have the technology. Right now I don't, but maybe I want to get the technology to colonize this planet because it seems to be pretty decent. So yeah, that's how it works for the most part, the exploitation of the universe. And I hope you understand why you need to exploit the universe. It is so that you can, again, make a more powerful empire. Now, I'm going to go through all of the windows that you have access to in this game, one by one, but to do that I'm going to load a different save file so you have a bit more of an in, you can see them a bit, you know, when they're a bit more developed. Be right back. This is a more advanced save file. As you can see, we are far, much further into the game. And as I slowly zoom in, you can see that there is way more stuff happening over here. But you don't necessarily need to worry about that right now. Also, by the way, if you notice any bugs, again, keep in mind this version of the game what you're seeing, you're probably not even gonna be able to play at all because it's. I'm still recording this before early access is released, so any bugs you see, keep in mind, will probably be fixed. So, let's go ahead and talk about various things. First, uh, first of all, before I talk about the windows, I need to remind you, this game has a special feature, meaning that whenever you want, you can press a spacebar. 
And what this is, is it allows you to see various things. So for, so for example, when I zoom out as much as I can, it shows me Diplomacy's tab, which shows various information which you can read on the left side. If I zoom in a little bit more, it shows me some more trade information. And if I keep zooming in, it shows me the detailed economy information about each system, and so forth and so forth. If I zoom in all the way into a system, it tells me a lot about the system uh, itself and the population that lives on the system, so I can understand it a little bit better. You might be very confused by this, don't worry, you understand what this means in time. For now, however, let us uh, let us zoom out from over here and have a quick look at all of the screens. So first things first, let's click at the government screen. It's very essential and it's uh, something that differs this game from Endless Space 1 or Endless Legend or most other Fox games. In this game you have a real government that is, I mean, as real as it can be, that is composed of real people who all have different ideas about how they imagine their uh, government, their, or rather their nation should look like, or operate, or how it should operate, or what is best for it, and so on, etc, etc. Which means that your people will vote for different things and support different actions. You can see your kind of senate breakdown over here. It shows you the kind of political support each of your parties has. You can have up to six uh, political parties, or you may have just one. Again, it depends from the wishes of your population and what they vote for. Every 10 turns, starting from 10-10, your population will vote for the kind of fact, uh, party you want to support. You can influence those people by various things. Every time you, the population votes, you can, for example, finance one particular party. Last time they did, I financed the militarist party because I like military and I wanted to have their support. I wanted to, to be more powerful. Why do I care about it? Or why should you care about it? Well, it's because your current party influences the kind of laws you can enact in your empire. As you can see, right now I have the excess tithe rule, which is a law I was able to elect because I had the support of the religious party, which allows me to gain more dust on my system, which, just to remind you, is your currency. You can elect any laws you have access to. Your laws have specific requirements. For example, in order to get this law, I need to have a broad militarist support, which I currently do. But some other laws are easy to get. For example, this one requires a moderate, this one requires a minimal military support. So as you can see, it's pretty easy to get. As long as you have a representative or a leading political party, then you can access its laws. And depending on your its support, you can then enact those laws. It does cost you influence to enact them. So that's, again, something you need to keep in mind. Now, if you want, you can also look at your population details, so you learn what kind of population lives in your empire. My current empire only has one type of population in it, but in most cases, you actually have several different types of population living in your empire, all of them very different, so it's a good look to check this screen fairly frequently, as uh, every, every time you assimilate a new population into your empire. In my case, I can learn about my people, the Vodiani, or as I call them, Pyramid Dudes, because they live in reverse pyramids in space, so Pyramid Dudes is pretty fitting for them. I can see that they really like religion. They, Whenever something happens that usually causes the people to like religion more, or to vote for religion, those people are extra eager to vote for religion. Or whenever something happens that causes people to vote for military, it also makes those people vote for religion. Which means that it's very hard for them to have anything that is a leading party other than a religious party. Especially if you want it to be just a military party. Well, you're gonna have to work very hard for it because they, whatever you do to boost the military party is also going to boost the religious party. You can see the traits that cause those kind of differentials on the left side over here. You can also see what each particular population type does for you when it's settled uh, by looking at this. For example, this volume people, they are pretty much awesome, amazing at everything, but they grow really, really slowly. Also, they like religion, so again, they usually try to vote for it if possible. This is why it is important to check what you saw previously. If you zoom in on your system and press space, you can see what your people are going to vote for. As you can see, I have a lot of people who vote for religious because they are, just by their very nature, really keen about religion. They are also fanatics. However, because of this world's... Uh, about because of this world's... what this world has been subject to, because it has been making many military ships, and because there were battles won, 
There, those people actually support militaries even more than they support religious people. But they also have their fair share of pacifists because of the people they have seen and because I was pretty nice towards minor factions. Minor factions, by the way, are kind of like pirates or barbarians in some other Forex games, except you can integrate them into your empire or have them work for you, or you can just ignore them and let them do their own thing. They are pretty robust in their own way, but right now I have no time to cover them, unfortunately. Let's go back to the government screen. As you can see, you also have your time chart that shows you if everything, how things happened and shows you when the last election happened. And you can also change your government to a different government type because they all have their own particular benefits or penalties. Now let's go ahead and keep moving. Next, you can see uh, the economy screen, economy tab or whatever you want to say. This shows you, for example, the trading companies. Right now I have one trading company, which allows me to get certain bonuses, depending on which systems this trading company can trade with. Right now I only have my main trading corporation and one branch. Now a trading corporation will try to uh, trade, uh, will try to establish a trade uh, network with its branches. So depending on the type of systems it passes through and the type of branches it has, it will give you the different benefits. So that's something you need to keep in mind. You generally want to use your trading companies, set, set up your trading companies in a way that gives you the most benefit so that they give more resources to your empire. Next, you've got the system development. Unfortunately, this save file, I did not unlock them. I thought I did, my apologies. But either way, once you unlock them, you can utilize your luxury resources to boost your entire empire in a specific way. For example, if I use up a certain amount of jade onyx, it will give me extra industry on a system, which is rather useful, as you might imagine. These resources, well, they are finite, so after boosting it, you lose a certain amount of those resources. You then be able to boost your empire again, assuming you have enough of those resources. And again, they are slowly replenished, so you have to manage your system development quite carefully. Next, we've got the science screen. As I said, this game is going to come out in early access with a lot of its technology missing, so you cannot even expect to see any of the late game technologies. Only the mid game at most. And those technologies, well, it's they're pretty straightforward. They're divided into four categories, or well, five actually. Uh, one category is for the absolute basics that every faction has always has access to and that is faction specific. For example, in this case, I have it gives me access to my specific ships as well as access to static technologies that every player starts with in every game. Now, the other screens were well, divided into four categories. For example, as you can see, this one is about the development of the entire empire. Generally, it's focused on approval, the happiness of your people. Another resource I didn't mention, you're, depending on how happy your people are, they're going to be more or less efficient at whatever they do. I think it's pretty obvious. Now, aside from happiness, it also boosts your empire's influence production or your food production on a given, any given system. On the, top, uh, on the bottom left, you've got access to things that boost your empire's uh, dust production or that boost your system's industry production or things that allow you to mine specific resources Again, that are strategic resources, which is rather important as you might imagine, because they allow you to make more powerful ships or buildings. In the bottom right, you have access to things that are related to warfare, and in the top right, you have things that are related to exploration. So, they, for example, can increase the power of your probes, allow you to move even when there are no lanes connecting different systems, or they allow you to colonize different planets as well. So, all of those are pretty important things. They need to keep in mind. Next, you've got the fleet management. Now, fleet management allows you to see all of the fleets you have access to, as well as the ship designs. You can modify your ship designs at any given point in order to fit what you want your ships to do. For example, this is my cheap officer ship. So, I equipped it with a basic sync laser and a basic pinch beam. I won't waste your time explaining exactly what each of these do or why I decided to equip my ship in a particular way, but do know that you can that you can go ahead and try to add more things to your ship or you can modify the way that your ship is already equipped. For example, maybe I want to have guns instead of lasers and for some reason the sound didn't play. Again, keep in mind, alphas, alpha, bugs happen. So, 
uh, every weapon has its particular benefits and advantages and disadvantages over other kinds of weapons. So do keep in mind uh, what each particular weapon can give you. And those are also not all the weapons. There are four weapon types. There are the kinetic weapons, there are the lasers, there are the beams, and there are also missiles, which you cannot see because I cannot install missiles on this particular ship type. Additionally, you have other things that allow your ship to survive, such as armor and shields. And finally, you have things that are different things, and there's a can be all kinds of things. For example, you can, as this faction, I can abduct essence. Basically, like, imagine vampires in space that suck out essence instead of blood. That's basically what this faction is about. Or I can install more engines, or improve the engines of my ship so that it moves faster. Or I can allow it to carry more soldiers to deploy when invading enemy systems. All of this you can do in here. You can also create an entirely new design or delete a design you no longer need. It's pretty important to keep uh, an eye out all of that. Next you've got the Academy screen, or rather the Heroes screen, which allows you to look at your current heroes. You always start with one hero and it's important to keep a close eye on your heroes because they can change the tides of battles and they can make hero Empire much more powerful and help you win the games. For example, heroes have abilities, like in an RPG. You can improve them, they gain more levels as you play through the game, and this allows you to invest their levels in particular skills that give them various types of benefits, that boost their offensive capabilities in battle, or that allow them to give more passive bonuses to various aspects of your empire. Additionally, you can also modify the way that your hero's ship works, because every hero in this game has their own private ship that they fly in with, if you want them to join the battle, that is. You don't necessarily have to ever see this ship, maybe you don't want your hero to fight, you can just assign him as a governor of a planet, and then he won't have to worry about your hero dying in a ship. By the way, if your hero dies, don't worry, it's not permadeath. You can still revive your hero by using a lot of dust. Next we've got the quest screen, which shows you your current ongoing quests. Those can be side quests, those can be your main faction quests, those can be all kinds of different things that you need to worry about. You are given your first faction quest on turn 3. As for any side quests, well, it depends on the side quest. So I cannot necessarily tell you when or where or how or even if you're gonna get them. But faction quests you always get at turn 3 and they basically tell the story of a faction as well as give you different incentives to do various tasks. If you do those tasks, you get bonuses of various kind. You get, maybe you get money, or maybe you, for example, get uh, something else like a new technology or whatever. It's pretty important to keep those things in mind. And last but by no means least, you've got the diplomacy, which allows you to see your stance with other empires, see how they like you or dislike you. Or this also allows you to trade. I don't currently have any technologies to trade with this empire because I didn't unlock them and additionally even if I did unlock them I wouldn't be able to do all that much because again alpha is alpha those things still change those things still get improved one thing I forgot to mention in the in this screen is that you also have access to star system screen from the left uh, leftmost screen which allows you to see all of your currently controlled systems uh, and uh, you know sort them by for example which one is most productive and this will allow you to know which is the most important. You can also even queue construction from within this system as well, which is pretty nifty. Policy is currently disabled because, well, it is disabled. Okay, I think that I pretty much covered everything that I needed to cover about this game. I won't explain any particular tactics on how to play this game to win it. Those I'll cover in future videos. There's just one last feature I need to cover and that is a battle. Because I want to cover it really badly, I decided to fight a battle that I pretty much have no chance of winning. It is a fleet of mine that has taken some damage, it's pretty old and it's pretty bad, fighting against a fleet of enemy that is, as you can see, it has full health and it's pretty powerful. Now whenever you do start a fight or whenever the enemy attacks you, you can choose to either watch it or not watch it. Either way, after you start a fight, you have no control over it whatsoever. You can choose what you, sh you want your ships to do before a battle, but once the battle starts, there you have no more control over it. So if you just want to issue orders and then see the results right away, disable the watch feature. If you want to see some space opera goodness, enable the watch feature. You can also retreat or you can also just retreat by the way. Let's go into the advanced options, shall we? Now this will allow you to simulate how we expect the battle to proceed. For example, 
maybe I expect the enemy to be prudent in reaction and gain, uh, as you can see, the benefit of this, as you see on the bottom below the action. This will allow the enemy to move in a particular way. Maybe the enemy will try to move in a different way. In this case, as you can see, this screen changes. This doesn't mean the enemy will move in a way that I select. This is my prediction. This allows me to see how I can counter the enemy. How do I expect the enemy to move? For example, as you can see, this screen shows the compatibility of the enemy's fleet or your fleet with the currently selected action. So, the enemy is an AI player. So, artificial intelligence tends to use what is most efficient and most compatible. So, I expect the enemy to use the interlock strategy because it's most compatible with the current setup. It's short range and it allows the enemy to move in quickly next to my uh, next to my ships and do as much damage as possible. It's pretty effective considering the kind of ships the enemy has. If I were to use my tactic, I will also have large compatibility because my ships are also more sufficient at close range. But the problem is, the enemy is more powerful than I am. If I had to go for this tactic, sure, my ships would be very efficient at what they do, but unfortunately, they would, well, most likely be utterly crushed because the enemy just simply has a more powerful fleet, as you can see. However, if I were to, for example, switch to a different battle plan, like a sniper battle plan, I'm barely compatible with this plan at all, but look at what happened. I was able to gain a star. This tells me that I'll have the range advantage, because my ships will be avoiding contact with the enemy ships, and they will turn in such a way that I will allow me to fire broadside, for example, at the enemy, where the enemy will have limited firing arc. Keep in mind, firing arcs are something you need to worry about when designing your ship. Basically, weapons that you can install on the side of your ships do not fire on the sides they are not installed on. Then, well, that's basically just logic for you. So, in this case, I should go for the long range strategy because even though my ships are not very good at this, they still will be able to avoid the enemy ships firing at my ships. So, they, there is a larger chance that I may inflict more damage on the enemy and survive for a little bit longer by choosing this strategy. But again, this is assuming that the enemy chooses the interlock system strategy. If they don't and they go for this strategy, well, then things just get awkward because we avoid each other altogether. So we'll see what happens. Let's start a fight, shall we? Now, this will take a moment to load, so let's just wait for that. And then let's start the battle. Now, the game really wants you to have a space opera feel of the battle. Like if you're watching a movie show or something like Battlestar Galactica or Star Trek or whatever. So. The game has a lot of emphasis on, for example, even battle preparations or whatever, but if you don't care about battle preparations, you can skip to the first shot file and just watch the action right away, because, well, let's be honest, some people don't care about the preparations, especially in early game when they take a long time before the ships actually reach each other. Now, as you can see, the long-range weapons on both of the fleets were able to fire fairly quickly, and, well, the enemy ships are firing at each other. If you press space right now, you will see your ships or the enemy ships health on the left side of your ships if I can if the auto camera will show it to me I could choose to switch to free camera but it's not very nice anyway on the left side you see my current shoot power on the right side you see my ships effectiveness basically it's not a set value as you can see it does move depending on how your ship is positioned to the other ship how far they are what kind of weapon they use basically the higher it is the better and in this case, the enemy is doing pretty well against me, and I have very low ship effectiveness. But that's okay, I'm mostly trying to avoid getting my ship destroyed, because as you can see, I'm taking quite heavy damage. My ships are being punctured, punctured over the place, they are being damaged and killed. And I'm just trying to avoid being fired on by the enemy, while firing at the enemy as much as I can. Just to process, there is nothing you can do while watching this. It is just for your own personal enjoyment. And, by the way, the, what you hear right now, for example, again, I didn't, you can barely hear those weapons that just fired even though we are looking at them right now. Again, it's most likely just back because it was different. And for example, at Gamescom it was different, the sound system was different. It, so, keep in mind, what you see right now is not final. Everything is subject to change, especially battles because they change very rapidly. So, let us wait for this battle to commence and uh, while we wait for that, I'll say my final remarks. About what I think about NS Space still well, as you know, my channel is pretty much dedicated to RPG Studios games. Not only, I also play other focus games and other non strategy games, even. But I do play mostly NS Legend in the past, the Space. So I was a big fan of the series, as you might imagine. 
So what about this game? Do I like it? Do I not like it? Do I think it has potential? The answer is yes, I definitely do think it has potential. In fact, it has scary potential. It still has all the things I liked from Endless Space 1. All of them. I don't think it's missing anything I didn't like from Endless Space 1. It has this calming atmosphere, this beautiful galaxy. It feels different from Endless Legend. A lot different. It's more... Not necessarily slow paced because it doesn't imply this game is more boring or tedious, but it's more relaxed despite the fact that you can have multiple fights and yeah, you do feel like you're watching a space opera. So there are occasional thrills, but in general, you just enjoy the show, you just take it in, you just inhale the goodness. And this game mapping is pretty good. It's still very far away from completion, don't get me wrong. It has lots of features that it needs to implement, but all the groundwork is there, and in my opinion, it works well. Whether or not it is a game for you, we well, are trying to explain the basics, and you have to make your own judgement if it is a game for you, or if it is not. If you have any questions, ask me in the comments below this video, and I'll do my best to answer them. I'm also going to make more videos about this game, so I have more chances to talk about individual features. However, right now this video cast has been long enough, as you can probably notice, so I should wrap it up. Ladies and gentlemen, it was Pawn Trussel also known as the Mighty Mig Spammer. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs> I hope you're excited for Endless Space 2, if you kind of like this kind of games. And if you liked my kind of video, then please do share the word, spread the word about me, because I'm, I have a pretty niche channel, but I do take my time to learn any particular amplitude to this game and become as good as I can be at particular Endless Space or in this legend game and teach you about how to win the good games and I try to be very thorough while teaching as well so please if you can spread the word I'll do greatly appreciate it thank you for watching and I'll see you online